We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Jerry Mitchell is the sort of journalist other reporters dream of becoming. During his career, he has investigated cold case murders from the civil rights era in Mississippi, and his work has directly led to convictions in several cases. That's not all. He also helped bring a suspected serial killer to justice. He has written about his career in a terrific memoir, Racing Against Time. Listener Tony Garner suggested that we interview Jerry, and we are so glad he did. We had a terrific conversation. I began by asking Jerry about a shadowy state governmental organization, which may have quietly condoned crimes against civil rights leaders. Uh, one thing that struck me is uh, reading about the Sovereignty Commission. Can you tell yeah. our listeners what that was and what that was about? Well, uh, the Sovereignty Commission was the state segregationist spy agency that Mississippi had. And it was run by the governor and other top state leaders in Mississippi. And they essentially kind of had two main arms. One was a propaganda arm where they would send white and black speakers up north. The black speakers were being secretly paid to go up north and talk about how wonderful segregation was. And then the other arm was a spy arm where they would infiltrate civil rights groups and then report back uh, to them. They would you know, use this information to smear civil rights workers, uh, get them fired from their jobs, et cetera. Wow. Um, it, it just sounds like a police state. It, it was. It was. And they had files on like more than 10,000 people, including people like Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and yeah, that, that, that's what they were. And, and so – they had collected more than a hundred and there were more than 138,000 pages of files and records. And I don't know if you're like me, but if someone tells me I can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. And, uh, so there was something called, uh, basically the sovereignty commission, which I didn't know existed. until I started reporting on, on the subject. Uh, all those records were sealed by the Mississippi legislature for 50 years. So when I found that out, my first thought was there, there's something in those files <laughs> and began to develop sources who had access to them. Yeah. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. 
We're the Murder Sheet, and this is Cracking Cold Cases, an interview with investigative journalist Jerry Mitchell. I want to step back a little bit uh, and just ask sure. you to to tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you became a journalist, and, and sort of share with sure. your audience that uh, journey. Yeah, I got into journalism way back in high school. I, I love to write, and so that's really – and my mom, I was reading three newspapers a day by the time I was seven or eight years old. We took that many newspapers plus magazines, and so my mom – it's always been that way, and, and I kind of fell in line with that and got into journalism in high school and really was more interested in the writing, to be honest. Uh, but once I kind of got, you know, graduated with a degree in journalism and did it for a while, I found out I was a lot better in reporting than I was in writing, so <laughs> I, I, which I didn't know, obviously, in advance. So uh, I really realized that I had a, a, a talent and skill that I had no idea I had. And that kind of led me into eventually into investigative reporting. And then how did you come to uh, sort of develop this focus on um, things like civil rights murders, but also just the abuses against uh, of the government yeah. against, uh, you know, with the Sovereignty Commission and everything like that? Well, what's, I, what really, the way my journey began is I happened to be assigned as a reporter to go cover a movie, which was a fictional film called Mississippi Burning, which was uh, based on the real life killings of these three young civil rights workers, James Chaney, Andy Goodman, Mickey Schwerner, who were killed by a Klan. And I knew nothing about this case, knew zero. But I happened to go see this movie with two FBI agents who investigated the case, as well as the journalists who covered that case. And I was really shocked to find out that more than 20, you know, Klansmen were involved in killing these three young men, but nobody ever been prosecuted for murder. And that, that really shocked me. And so that kind of, I would say, began my education about you know, the civil rights movement, some of the violence attached to it, which I, I knew nothing about, to be honest. So I began my journey. Yeah. So can you talk about how you tried to get access to the records of the Sovereignty Commission? Yeah. So I found that these guys, you know, um, my first, uh, I, I was able to get my first leak, I guess, through the court. And then that led me then to the sources Um there was a guy by the name of Ken Lawrence who was uh, an activist and was also involved in the litigation to try to open these Sovereignty Commission files, which were sealed for 50 years. And so I began to kind of press him for details. And one night, uh, he literally just started reading from the files to me. And so I took those notes down, uh, didn't have the files themselves in hand, but then found out just serendipitously that somebody I knew had access to the files, this lawyer I knew. And so I began, I basically ran uh, that information by him, and he was able to confirm that what I had was accurate from the files. And that kind of began my journey, and then eventually got another source to uh, give me, it was about 2,400 pages, what I call it, called the Sovereignty Commission's Greatest Hits, uh, those files. It was about a dozen uh, notebooks uh, that, that were, you know, filled with these files. And so those, 
and and basically what I found in the files was at the same time the state of Mississippi was prosecuting a guy named Byron Deal Bickwith for the murder of Meg Rivers. This other arm of the state, the Sovereignty Commission, was secretly assisting defense trying to get back with acquitted, and nobody knew that. And so uh, that story ran October 1st of 1989. What was the reaction to that story? Were, I mean, I'm sure people were shocked, but did you get any pushback from powers that be? Oh, yeah. I mean, there were uh, you know, there were a number of people that were not happy to, that I was digging into these things. I, I remember having some guy of all places at church <laughs> kind of accost me that I was writing these stories. Of, Why was I writing these stories, you know? And, uh, yeah, but I had, um, but I went, after I did that story, I went to Merle Evers, the widow of Meg Evers, and ask her if she thought the case should be reopened. And uh, she read my story and, and had reached out to her own family and talked with her own family and then called me back and said, you know, this case, you know, my husband's case should be reopened. And I was compared to kind of like a snowball at the top of a, a tall mountain, you know, it just kind of began rolling down the hill. And by the time it got to the bottom of the hill, it was an avalanche. It was just one thing after another. Uh, that kind of led to this avalanche uh, that eventually uh, resulted in the indictment of of Byron D. Lebecca. So, uh, yeah, I I did go and interview him. Um, You know, to back up a little bit, you know, at the time that I wrote this story about this case, you know, the odds were probably more than a million to one against the case ever being reopened, re-prosecuted. There was no murder weapon, no transcript, you know, from the court trial, um, nothing of any kind of value in the court files. Um, but Murray Evers, you know, believed and she prayed and some amazing things happened. A couple months later, Jackson police are cleaning out a closet, having to find a box that contained the crime scene photographs of the killing of Meg Evers including a fingerprint of Byron D. Lebeck with listed from the murder weapon. A few months after that, she shared with me her copy of the court transcript that she saved in a safety deposit box. And a few months after that, the prosecutor in the case found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet, which sounds like I'm making it up, but it all really did happen. Uh, but I did go interview Byron D. Lebeck with in April of 1990. He lived in a place called Signal Mountain, Tennessee, which is just outside Chattanooga. And so we, um, anyway, we talked for about six hours. Absolutely the most racist person I ever spent serious time with. It was like inward this, inward that, and, uh, and then started on all the other non-white races. Um, he's, he's a part of what's called Christian identity, which is this real racist religion. And, um, so we got, it was starting to get dark. I thought it was a, a good time to, to leave. And just, you know, like walking me out to my car and I'm like, really, that's okay. I, I, I think I can find my way. So he walked me out this car, out to my car and, and we got out there and he said, if you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you. If you write negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. And so his wife had made me a sandwich. I think you can guess what I did with the sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. That was, it was fascinating. Uh, yeah, and so he didn't know when I went up and interviewed him that I was the one that wrote the story to get the case reopened and uh by the time he got indicted, he figured it out, and, and he wound up fighting extradition, wound up back in Mississippi, and he saw me across the courtroom, and he said, you see that boy over there? When he dies, he's going to Africa. And I turned to a friend of mine, and went, you know, I always wanted to go to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Byron D. LeBeck was, was convicted February 5th, 1994, and since the life of Chris, you know, it was... Uh, incredible moment and uh what what did that what did that mean to the family uh, merle evers to see that conviction yeah i mean 
Um, I mean, just to watch her and watch her family's reaction to that after the, she told me to back step, uh, to back up just one step. Um, the night, the, you know, the jury had begun to deliberate and they had, uh, for several hours. And it was very obvious when they came back in the courtroom that um, they were upset. But some of them were upset and angry. I could tell this one woman in particular that, you know, it was pretty obvious they'd been arguing. She was red faced and upset and angry. And so I was real concerned, you know, the jury was going to hang up. And, um, you know, because you obviously have to have a unanimous verdict. You know, all 12 jurors have to agree on a verdict. And I was talking that night to Marilee Evers, and she told me a story she'd never told me before, which was, um, that when Medgar was uh, assassinated, her husband was assassinated, uh, and there were these white bystanders. They, they, they lived very close to a white neighborhood. This was all segregated time in Mississippi. Uh, so you had, this was a black neighborhood, but there was a white neighborhood not that far from there, and store and different things like that. And so these white bystanders came, uh, white police came, and Merle Evers told me if she had had a machine gun that night, she would have mowed down everybody white. And it dawned on me that when she told me that, that I had no idea what she had gone through. She and her family gone through. And then when the verdict came in, she told me afterwards, she cheered the verdict, obviously, and her family did. And she told me afterwards that when the verdict came in, she heard that word guilty, that she felt like that every bit of anger and hate went out every pore of her body. And, wow. Just a... Uh, I just feel very privileged to have been, you know, a witness to a lot of this. So, an incredible, incredible case, incredible family. Yeah, it, it's it's an amazing story, and it's just one of several stories in your book where you write about your uh, efforts to help get justice for other. Uh, Victims, can you tell us a little bit about the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing? Sure, um, you know the, the in uh, September of 1963, Birmingham saw the integration of its first public school, and um, the Klan w was not happy with this, and the the downtown church there, the 16th Street Baptist Church, had been kind of the center for this civil rights activity. Uh, you know, we've all seen the, the dogs and the fire hoses and things like that from the spring of 1963. And so that church was kind of the staging area for the Children's March and that had been taking place. And so the Klan planted a bomb in that church uh, on the morning of September 15th, 1963, it, it killed four girls, blinded a fifth girl, and injured dozens of others. Uh, it, you know, blew up while, you know, church services were going on. Um, and so, um, yeah, that, that the case, uh, one of the last living suspects was a guy by the name of Bobby Cherry. Good not McCroskey in that case. And so I talked to him by telephone and then I got an email from his wife who said, Bobby wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay. Uh, so I drove over to see him. It turned out that he lived near Tyler, Texas, which is not far from where I grew up, which is the schizophrenic town of Texarkana. So I knew where he lived, went to meet, meet him, he and his wife, and took him out for barbecue because 
I guess that's what you take Klansmen out for. I'm not really sure. But, uh, but we went out. We had barbecue. And he insisted he had nothing to do with, uh, you know, the bombing. Uh, and what he told me was, uh, I didn't have anything to do with that bombing. I left that sign shop. The sign shop he's talking about is literally two blocks from the church. It's also where the Klan made the bomb. And I left that sign shop at a quarter to seven because I had to get home and watch wrestling. So he pulled out that sworn statement from this woman. Yes, I remember that night well. We're all sitting around watching wrestling. So one of the rules of journalism, and this is the way we say it in the South, even if your mama tells you she loves you, check it out. And uh, so I did. So I was in the newsroom the next day and just said to our librarian, Susan Garcia, hey, Susan, see what was on TV the night of September uh, 15th, you know, September 14th, night 60. That's the night before. And because back in those days in the 60s, you used to have the, you know, entire television schedule from the newspaper. And I knew that. And so next day I heard back from Susan. There was no wrestling. Turned out they had never, there wasn't any wrestling on for him to be watching. So, so he got arrested in that case and, and eventually uh, prosecuted and uh, also found out about that he was involved in the beating of Fred Schulzworth and tracked down footage on that, um, which was fascinating as well, which his son identified to me. It identified his own father. I played the footage for him, and he identified his own father, which was wild. Um, but, yeah, he was convicted in uh, 2002 and, sent, and given four life sentences, one for each one of those girls. I want to backtrack a second and just go sure. back to the uh, – how How do you, as a reporter, uh, get a Klansman or a suspected Klansman to, you know, let them into – you know, let you into their house and give you sandwiches or, you know, take, take yeah, them out for exactly. barbecue. You know, like that's a skill set. I, 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 could you speak to that? I sure. Well, like with Byron deal back with, I had to pass the quiz. Like he had a long, kind of a long quiz and I don't tell whole quiz. I think in the book, but, but you know, some of the quiz in my book, but he was like, uh, where'd you grow up? What are your parents' names? Where did you go to college? Where do you go to college? Where do you live? Like, I could have refused to answer those questions, you know. But I knew he loved my answers. So I just kind of answered honestly. And then, like I said, in the, in the Birmingham case, um, I got invited. I had already talked to him on the telephone before. And I think they had read... I wrote this piece called The Preacher and the Klansman that was, this is pretty early days of the internet that his wife read. And I don't know if she liked it or what it was. It's the story of a, a black civil rights leader and his Klansman who's involved in this violence who then gives it up and, you know, becomes friends with um, this civil rights activist. I don't know. I have no idea to this day why she invited me and why I got invited over. But I, I think in general, you know, I'm a Southerner. I grew up in the South. I have the accent. Um, you know, Byron D. Lebeck was quoted scripture to me, and I certainly was familiar with it and could talk scripture to him. And, and all those kinds of things, I think, you know, played in, uh, played into, you know, my benefit. And I think the other part of it as well is they were – they really were arrogant, I think, at, at, at the core, and that they thought they'd gotten away with it. And so that also was something, as well as the fact that they're older and they kind of want to tell their life story. So that was always the basis. I typically would talk to these guys. I'd want to hear their life story. And I was. I was honest about that. I wasn't, you know, just trying to mislead them at all because I wanted to know what all happened in their lives. Right. You, it, it sounds like your, your natural curiosity benefited you a lot there. It did. It did. Jerry told us about another one of the cases he worked on. Bernie Damer was a farmer, a businessman, an entrepreneur, um, and he was dedicated to voting rights. And so uh, the Klan didn't like that. 
And so they attacked him and his family uh, January 10th, 1966. It was about like 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, the Klan, you know, firebombs their house and their grocery store, uh, you know, began firing their guns into the house. Vernon and Damer woke up, you know, smelled the smoke, heard the gunfire, grabbed his shotgun, ran in front of the house, began firing back at the Klansmen so that his family could escape safely out a back window. Uh, unfortunately, the flames of the fire seared his lungs and he died the next day. Uh, a few weeks later, in the mail came his voter registration card. He fought his whole life for the right of all Americans to be able to vote but never been able to cast a ballot himself. And the guy who ordered the killing was the guy by the name of Sam Bowers, who was the head of the White Knights of the KKK, responsible for at least 10 killings that we know of during the Civil Rights Movement, probably more. Um, so Bowers had been prosecuted in that case, but never been convicted. And so the Damer family approached me after Byron D. Lebeck was indicted in December of 1990 and, um, and just invited me down to visit with them. They, they lived near Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which is where that happened. I was, they lived still on the property where this attack took place. And so they just kind of walked me through it, told me about it, explained what happened. I knew nothing of any of the case and just began to work on it. Um, the district, they met with me, they met with the district attorney. I did a story. And nothing real. I mean, the DA said he was going to do something about it. But got cold feet over time. Then a new district attorney came in who seemed even less interested. And I got this fellowship to go to Ohio State to get my master's in journalism. So I was literally in Ohio when I got this phone call from this guy who wanted to meet with me. He said he had information on the Vernon Damer case. So I flew back to Mississippi, met with him. Um, and um, it turned out that he had overheard Sam Bowers give the orders to kill Vernon Dane. So he came forward. And then um, there was the guy who'd been the key witness back in the 1960s, had been a guy named Billy Lloyd Pitt. And he was involved in the killing, dropped his gun, got caught, plea guilty, murdered, got a life sentence for that, plea guilty. The federal charges and got five years for that. And so I was researching actually how much time he spent behind bars as well as these other guys. It was a bit of a joke. Some of got pardoned, et cetera. So I was researching him, and I couldn't find any record of his state time, but what I was told is he went into the Federal Witness Protection Program. So I'm talking to the Federal Bureau of Prisons about how much time he spent in federal prison. And I asked the archivist about it who pulled his file, and she said, that he spent three and a half years in federal prison. I said, I understand he left there and went to the Federal Witness Protection Program. She said, that's impossible. I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, there was no Federal Witness Protection Program back then. So what this meant was Billy Roy Pitts had never served a single day of his life since in Mississippi. Um, kind of a big oversight. <laughs> and so I didn't know if this guy was alive or dead or where he was. And this is the relatively early days of the Internet. So... I knew there was a website I could put in the name and not have to have the city and state. So that's what I did. And up at top, Billy Roy Pitts, that is address, Denim Springs, Louisiana, his telephone number. So I called him. First 20 minutes of the conversation went like this. How did you find me? How did you find me? I'm like, on the Internet. The Internet, I have a list of telephone numbers. So it was all my story that he had never served a single day of his life since the Mississippi authorities issued a warrant for his arrest. And uh, he didn't like that. In fact, he ran. And while he was on the run, he sent me this audio cassette, which I played since the top began. Jerry, I just thought I'd let you know you've ruined my life. But I promise I'll talk to anybody. I'll talk to you. So here's his tape. And on his tape, he proceeds to tell me all about his involvement in killing Bernard Damer, all about his involvement all this other clan violence. So shortly after this, he turned himself into authority, and this now led to the arrest of Sam Bowers. Uh, and uh, this is now May of 1998. And so he was arrested, and Bowers went on trial, essentially, in 1998 and was convicted in that case. 
the fact that he he's mad at you for having to go on the run and he's still giving you like a remote interview like that and is I know. That's insane. It's, you can't make it up. You can't make it up, can you? <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and then your book sort of begins and ends with the case that really got you involved in all this, which is the uh, Mississippi burning case. I was just wondering if you could tell us something about that. Sure. Um, so I mentioned I went to the movie and uh, really began to learn about that case, really began to work on it some uh, before the Sovereignty Commission Mega River stuff kind of came into my lap. And um, and they weren't pursuing it at that time. You know, they just, for whatever reason, the state just wouldn't pursue it. In fact, I, I spent years working on this case. But what arose, um, to get the, I guess you could say, to drag me back into the case, was uh, I found out that Sam Bowers, the same guy that got convicted, the head of the Klan that got convicted in the Damer case, had done this interview, never gave interviews. He hated the press. He considered us satanic uh, in his own words. Uh, but And so he, he never had anything to do with the press, but he'd done an interview with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, but with Seal. Well, during the Damer investigation, the attorney general's office had actually subpoenaed that interview. And so what I did was able to get one of the investigators from the attorney general's office to let me come and read that interview. And, and, and so he let me come and read it and he just let me read it and take notes. And so in that interview, he talked about the Mississippi burning case and he was one of seven Klansmen convicted. The rest of the 18 walked away free. And Bauer said he was quite delighted to be convicted and have the main instigator of the entire fair walk out of the courtroom a free man. He was referring to a guy by the name of Edgar Ray Killen, or as he's known locally, Preacher Killen. So I called him up. We talked for about 20 minutes. And finally, at some point, he said, there's some guy in Jackson who just keeps stirring things up and stirring things up and stirring things up. And I didn't have the heart to tell him it was me. <laughs> so I took him and his wife out for catfish. So, uh, and we talked. And I asked him if he had anything to do with the killing of three civil rights workers. He said, no. I said, what do you think should happen to the people that were responsible? He said, well, I'm not going to say they were wrong. And then he proceeded to tell this story about himself. When Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, um, at that moment in time, the FBI had no idea who did it. So they kind of sent out agents everywhere. Two of them show up at the doorstep. A preacher Killen wanted to know his whereabouts on April 4th, 1968. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't talk. Killen wouldn't talk. But the agent left his card. So time goes on. Uh, one day, preacher Killen picks up the card, calls the agent, wants to know who killed King. And the agent's like, well, why do you want to know? Killen says, man, I want to shake his hand. And, uh, you know, sometimes I have people criticize me. They'll say, Jerry, why don't you leave these old men alone? And I just tell them, you know, these are young killers. They just happen to get old. Edgar Killen was convicted on the exact anniversary of the killings of those three young men, uh, June 21st in 2005 on the 41st anniversary. And uh, he was sentenced uh, to 60 years in prison where he died, as well as all these other Klansmen that, that in these cases that all died in prison. Wow. And that's incredibly, incredibly powerful that that happened on the anniversary. Absolutely. Just amazing. And, uh, and I am a person of faith. And so, um, I feel like God's hand's been involved in these cases. And I mean, to me, the timing of that would just seem way too coincidental. Yeah. And I, I want to note, I don't think you talk about it in in the book that Kevin and I both read, but, um, but you, I, I was doing some research and I came across this as well on the internet that you also, when you're not, <laughs> when you're not taking on these Klansmen, you're also, uh, you also helped uh, uncover this, uh, the serial killer, Felix Bale. Yeah, I wrote a yeah, serial killer case I worked on as well. That was a wild case. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I had this mother call me out of the blue. She had heard me on the radio, uh, on public radio, and called me and said, would you be interested in writing about a serial killer living in Mississippi? And, you know, I wouldn't be much of an investigative reporter if I didn't answer yes to that question, right? So I was like, yeah, sure, I'd love to. Uh, but, um, and so she told me. And so the guy's name was Felix Vale. He had been married to his first wife. And um, she had, uh, quote, unquote, drowned accidentally in, in 1962. Eleven years later... He has common law wife disappeared, and eleven years after that, his another wife disappeared. And so she started like telling me more about it, and I was like, I was struggling to kind of follow her because it was kind of not necessarily going in sequential order on these things. And but he'd never been arrested, and I, I just was trying to figure out as a reporter, you know, you want to kind of have something to hang your hat on. Um, he'd never been arrested for any of this. I thought, well, how can I write a story <laughs> about a serial killer? You know? Um, and so, but she then later called me and told me she was going to go confront him. So I'm like, uh, she was going to confront him and wanted to tell him that she knew he killed these three women. He might never, you know, ever anything ever happened to him, but she knew he'd kill these women and wanted to confront him about that. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, I want to go with you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, to me now, all of a sudden I see, Oh, okay. I can do a story now. I've got this mother confronting a serial killer. Um, and, you know, you know, I have to even call him a serial killer. She was just going to make the accusation. So I went with her. You, you know, met her, and then we drove in her car, this real remote area. It's about a half, half a, an hour north of Starkville, um, Mississippi. People know where that is. Uh, it's where Mississippi State is. Um, and so, anyway, we uh, I went with her, went in her station wagon. We got there. She parked the car, uh, checked the gate. It was locked. She hopped over the gate. And then um, I followed her, and it was – the weeds, I swear, were like 10 feet high. Like, you couldn't see the sun. The weeds were so high. And we finally get – go down the dirt road, finally get to this clearing, and there's a trailer. And so she goes and knocks on the trailer door, and there's no answer. And I'm kind of curious. And I'm like, is the guy really there and not answering? So I kind of peek in the window and I'm seeing. And then I start noticing the woods behind us. And now I'm getting very curious. I'm like, okay, is this guy really around? And by this time, she's already off at the second trailer. And she gets over there before I do and figures out that the back window is missing of this trailer. So she crawls inside. And she then opens the front door. So now I can see in. I wasn't going to step into the trailer and want to be accused of trespassing. Um, I was kind of following the, the kind of general rules of journalism we, we do uh, in, in approaching a home like a trailer or something like that on a property. And so she starts rummaging around, and the next thing I know, she throws out a machete that clanks on the floor, and then another machete, and then another machete, and then all these swords. And I'm like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> uh, so we talked over dinner. Uh, she had these two manila folders that were full of you know, hundreds of pages of, you know, newspaper articles and uh, different other things she had. And the first thing she showed me some of the newspaper articles about his first wife. And I noticed in one of the paragraphs, that he had taken out a life insurance policy on his wife before she, quote, unquote, drowned accidentally, which I thought was highly suspicious. Uh, and um, and then she showed me the autopsy reports in that case. 
And then when I saw that, I thought, okay, this is something I could possibly use, being familiar with those. So I sent it to uh, a forensic pathologist I know. In fact, Dr. Michael Bond is the one who did Mega Rivers' second autopsy. And he came back to me and said, this is a homicide. And, um, and pointed out, all oh, there's a bruise on the back of her head, there were bruises on her legs, there was a scar four inches into her mouth. And I thought, oh my, he killed his first wife and got away with it. How did that happen? And I did some more digging and come to find out this district attorney was friends with Fieldsville family. His, the district attorney's father actually worked directly with Felix Vale's uncle, and they were very good friends. I actually met Felix Vale and went and visited her in her nursing home uh, near Lake Charles, and she told me all this. They were about what good friends they were, and now I realize, okay, this is what happened. Why well, I never got arrested in this case. Um, and so, yeah, I just wrote about it. I wrote I, at the middle in the middle of my reporting on this case, Field Sale disappeared. Like in the middle of my reporting, he just left, vanished, and no one knew where he went. And so I still wrote the piece, uh, and it ran. It was about. 9,000 words, and it ran in November of 2011. And a, a few days after it ran, I got a call from someone who grew up with Felix, who had actually, he said Felix had actually talked about killing his first wife. And, um, and then, not too long after that, I got another call, and this was from someone who knew where Felix Vale was now because he had left a forwarding address and he was living in Canyon Lake, Texas. So then I knew where he lived. I told authorities about it. And not too long after that, I heard that he was going to leave the country. And so I contacted the district attorney directly and let him know that. And they ended up arresting him. And, um, yeah, I was in, yeah, it's just an amazing, amazing case. I, I one of the things that happened, is, you know, I knew the case was kind of thin. Was, I mean, you know, this is so like over a half century at this point, you know, he's being arrested for his first wife's murder. So this is right. 1962. Yeah. This is now, you know, he's arrested in 2013. So it's already more than a half century old. Um, so I kind of kept digging on the case, kept working on the case, and so I kept writing about the case, and I got a phone call. And this woman was hysterical. I mean, like, I couldn't make out a single word. She was just hysterical. And I was almost, had almost hung up the phone when she said, um, uh, I used to be married to Field Sale. I'm like, oh, wow. And so it turned out uh, she was married to Field Sale for about a month in 1977. He, um, she was telling me they had an argument. And she was kind of tired, you know, verbal argument. She was kind of tired of the argument. And she told him, I'm, look, I'm going to go take a shower. So she went in to take a shower. She gets in the shower. And the next thing she knows, Felix Dale comes into the shower and starts strangling her. And she managed to scream. Um, her brother happened to hear her and came in and rescued her from Felix. And so, obviously, horrific. And then she, I asked her, well, it, you know, who Felix is? I would typically ask this question to everybody I talk to who knew Felix is, who was he close to? Because you're always looking in a case or maybe somebody who has some additional information. Someone who's close to him would more likely he might confess to. So she told me the name of his best friend at the time in San Diego. And, uh, and so I went online to find this guy and it turned out he was dead. Um, but it also turned out that he had a twin. And so I called his twin brother. He's like, Oh man, I, I wish, you know, my brother was alive. He could have told me some things. Um, anyway, 
He acted like he didn't know me. The next day, I happened to call back because I, w- I was trying to nail down better when Felix was in San Diego and in that part of California. And the wife is the one who answered the phone. And she said, well, there's something my husband didn't tell you. She puts her husband on the phone. He's like, yeah, we had a party one time. And all the guys were bragging about something that nobody else there had done. And Felix said he killed his first wife. So I got, so he told me that. And then the next day, a buddy of his, whom he had contacted, called me. He too had heard Felix talk about killing his first wife, drowning her. And um, so when the trial happened, uh, both those men testified, and so did Mary Rose, the mother who contacted me originally about her daughter, um, you know, disappearing. And Felix Bale was convicted. It's the oldest conviction of a serial killer in U.S. history, almost 54 years in between the murder and, and the conviction. And weirdly enough, what had started would have been such a brittle case to begin with. By the time it went on trial, it, they literally took longer to pick a foreman than they did to convict Felix Bale. So, really an amazing case. That is just incredible. I I wanted to ask you something about, you know, sure. you mentioned, you know, like, um, you know, kind of interactions with police and DAs and stuff, you know, in, in your experience. And I, imag- I imagine it might be varied uh, based on a number sure. of factors, but have authorities been pretty cooperative <laughs> with you in your reporting? Does yeah, it depend? Well, well, it's really funny. I mean, I've, uh, I've had varied. I mean, some of them hate my gut. And, you know, because I report on the story, I mean, they may or may not like this. You know, some of them don't want to do these cases or some of them, um, they consider I'm, I'm what I'm doing. I'm being a pest. I'm interfering with the work in some way. I had, uh, as people can see in the book, my relationship with the prosecutor in the Mega Rivers case was kind of varied. I mean, at one, you know, at certain points it was good and at other points it was not good. Um, when I found the murder weapon, for example, that the district attorney's office had the murder weapon and they kind of publicly said that they didn't know where it was. Well, there was quite a hubbub about that. And, and, and so they were mad at me for that. So that's an example of maybe, maybe a not so good relationship, but then I got along well with, uh, the authorities in the, in the Birmingham church bombing case, Doug Jones was the U S attorney. And still to day, you know, talk to Doug once in a while. And then, um, and then in the, in the serial killer case, after Felix Vale, I should have mentioned this, but when he was sentenced, he, um, all he did was complain about me. It was like his sentencing hearing, he spent his whole time complaining about me, which is the ultimate compliment to journalists, isn't it? You know, and he said, uh, that I'd gotten all my ideas from my stories from, uh, from um, James Patterson novels. And I, and I told someone, I guess I'll have to read them. <laughs> <laughs> and after the hearing, the district attorney comes up to me and goes, well, Jerry, if you know any other guilty sons of bitches, you just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, you know, that's what it's like as a reporter sometimes. Sometimes they hate your guts and sometimes they, sometimes they like you. Exactly. Um, and, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to point out because, you know, I'm a I'm a my day job is a, I'm, a, I'm a business reporter. And I just want to point out, like, it's not the typical journalism career where you take down a bunch of Klansmen and a serial killer. And so I guess would love to get uh, if you could give some like advice for people who might want to, uh, you know, go into investigative journalism or, or kind of sure. put their time to that yeah. use. You know, how, how do you get started and how do you excel? Yeah, well, it's a great question. It's, you know, I think the key to investigative reporting as well as into a lot of other jobs is just persevering. I think there's something to be said for that. I mean, I think, I don't think I'm even that, you know, I don't know that I was the most talented person in my own newsroom. You know, it, I just think that 
that characteristic for whatever reason. I'm kind of like a, a dog with a dang bone or something. You know what I mean? I, I just don't, you know, I, I just, well, I learned it pretty early uh, to backtrack in my career. I learned it pretty early. I was working as a young journalist in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It has nothing to do with any civil rights cases or cold cases or anything. I was investigating this kind of corruption connected to the theme park. And um, I was writing about this, you know, all the time. You know, I just kept finding out stuff. And I kept writing about it. I mean, uh, and so eventually this guy sued. It had to do, it's really complicated, but it involved these city bonds, tourism bonds that were going toward this theme park. And the city had backed those bonds. And the banks had bought these bonds. And that turns out they had misspent the bond money. Like, I, I, I reported all this. And so this guy ended up suing a motel owner, which they were part among those who contributed to the tourism tax. And I just asked the guy why he decided to sue. He goes, because there wasn't any money in it. Or it's like he wasn't suing for damages. He was just suing to have the bonds thrown out. So what, what made you decide to sue? He says, I got tired of reading about the paper. So I thought, this stuff works. <laughs> I think when I was a young journalist, I thought, yeah, I'm going to write this, you know, great story and everyone's eyes will be opened, you know, investigative story. And I just learned over time, a lot of times it's more of a steady drumbeat instead of, uh, you know, necessarily. I mean, yes, you can have a huge story, but you you follow that up and you you persevere. And so, yeah, that would be, I guess, some of my advice. Uh, and I hope we have more and more people going to investigative journalism. I've, I've started a nonprofit called Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. And uh, so we've actually got 14 young journalists that are joining us this summer that are uh, from all over the country. And so we're excited to work with them uh, and really want to do that kind of thing to, to bring up the next generation. We want to thank Jerry Mitchell again for talking with us. His memoir, Racing Against Time, is a terrific read, and we highly recommend it. To our surprise, we've gotten a number of requests from people saying they would like a way to help financially support our efforts with the show. So, if you are interested, we are relaunching a Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. Join us there for two live video question and answer sessions each month. You can ask us anything, suggest new cases for us to look at, or even offer ideas for new leads for us to follow. If Patreon is not your thing, you can buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. Thanks for the interest. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.